morning and welcome to service this morning. It's good to have everyone here today. We're glad that you've chosen to come out and to serve the Lord today. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer to begin. Just a couple of announcements. Do remember the church has entered a building fund uh, project, and that is to add on the back of the Family Life Center about 3,000 square foot of classroom space. Keep that in your prayer if you would. Just keep the church in mind as decisions are made that we would make the right decisions in each one of those. And then also would ask you to remember Brother Paul Sheets in prayer. Uh, he is in the hospital. I haven't heard this morning how's he, how he's doing, but uh, do keep him in prayer if you would. Had a couple rough days here over the last few days. Uh, and then also remember Miss Lou Allen uh, in prayer. She's in the hospital as well. So we ask you to keep those things in mind. I know there were requests made in Sunday school classes. We ask you to remember those throughout your week. Uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, there will be an upward closing ceremony. The basketball season ended yesterday. Closing ceremony will be today at 2. And then tonight is our CTS presentations from all of the students who are competing in that this year. So we invite you to come back for that at 6 o'clock. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, though, to begin our service today. It is good to have you all here. Um, Brother Mike Burles, would you care to open us in prayer this morning? I do want to mention one other thing. Today at 5 o'clock is uh, the choir will begin practicing for Easter. There will be a couple of songs that the choir will perform for Easter or present. If you would like to be a part of that, you just come at 5 o'clock today. And you are welcome to join in as the choir will uh, practice for Easter. Easter is not far away, believe it or not. This is the last Sunday in February. So as we look at March, uh, spring is on its way as we see outside today. And we look forward to it. At this time, we're going to ask Miss Jana and Miss Claudia to come and present our special music. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good with every of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. 
after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. When my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. When my life lay down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Let's stand together. Let me give you a reminder today that if the song service gets a little bit long for you physically and you feel like you have the need to sit down, you feel free to do that, okay? Because sometimes I know it's a little bit long and we want you to feel the freedom to stand and, and sit as you need to, okay? Uh, we've, we've been plagued a little bit with sickness today out of our music, and uh, so we're going to depend on you guys to help us out vocally, okay? Sometimes it's a little unnerving from up here. I'll just, when we're looking out and there's 300 people looking at us, we get a little nervous and scared. So you guys smile at us and make us feel like it's all wonderful and, uh, and sing out loud with us today, okay? A new name written down in glory. Let's sing that together. One, two, three. Nice.
hymns that was ever written is also one of my favorites and I think you know it let's sing it together there is a name I love to hear I love to see it's word it sounds like music Thank you. 
different times of life kind of confuse us time to time. The roller coaster of life does like this, doesn't it? Things that challenge our faith, things that challenge us physically. Um, there are those times that are going to come for all of us. And I wonder during those hardest times if God is waiting for those of us who say we really trust Him to say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Even though times are down, even though things don't seem to be right with life right now, Lord, I know you're still in control and I still trust you. Listen to these verses. Psalm 103, 1 through 4 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Amen. Who forgives your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy.
we're grateful today that the God of the universe that looks down, He understands everything. The things that trouble us, that, that we can just not understand sometimes in life. Lord, today you have that under control. Help us to trust you. We bless your name today. We love you. We thank you for the sovereignty that teaches us faith. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to trust you more and more with each day that passes. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, we're going to pick up with verse 12 today. <clears throat> While you're turning there, I want to share a little bit today uh, concerning the title of the, the sermon is Discerning the Will of God. And when we start thinking about trying to figure out God's will for our life, sometimes we become overwhelmed by that. Remember a teenage girl when we were doing youth many years ago, and she came and she said, I just don't know what God wants me to do. She said, What do I do? And I said, Well, first off, you. Let God know that you're willing to do what He wants you to do. But when you pray that, you better be ready because who knows what He's going to want you to do. So we have to be, have a willingness to do what God wants or calls us to do. But I remember graduating from high school even and, and wondering what is it that I should do, trying to figure out exactly what I was supposed to do with my life. Went into college and spent a year in college. I was offered a full-time job at an ag business company after that year, and my dad was adamant that I finished college, and I didn't know what to do, so I'd done both. And um, ended up, that's why it took me seven years to finish college, but, but we got through that. But, um, you know, I didn't know what to do. And sometimes we don't have a clear-cut answer of what it is that we need to do. I did through... Uh, Taking the job that I took, I did meet Jennifer, which um, I think was the right thing. So uh, after 30 years, I guess I should know by now, right? But uh, when I surrendered to ministry, it was the same kind of deal. I, it was a difficult time in that moment, just trying to figure out exactly what God wanted to happen. A little over seven years ago when we were trying to decide whether to leave a church in Jonesboro that we loved very much and still love to this day to come here. And it was a hard decision. And I got it wrong to begin with. Thankfully, the church was gracious and, and uh, got it right after that. But, um, and we're glad to be here today. And now we love two churches. But uh, at the same time, knowing what God wants you to do can be difficult in life. As we look at what the apostles are dealing with in the second part of chapter 1 of Acts, they have a decision to make. And and there's two different things, two concepts I want us to grasp out of uh, this text today. One is there is a revealed will of God. God makes clear throughout His Word in Scripture that there are things that He wants us to know that we are to do and things we are not to do. We call it His revealed will. It's written out plainly in black and white for us. As we read Scripture, we find out there's certain things we should do. Husbands and wives are to be married. They are to raise their children together in the ways that the Lord would want them to raise them. We find that we are to serve the Lord our God above all else. Nothing should take the place of Him. There are certain things that we know this is what we're supposed to do. There are certain things we know we're not supposed to do. No idols. And man, we are full of a world of idols. And they're some of the smallest things sometimes, but they become idols in our life. We also have this concept, not the revealed will, but the unrevealed or concealed will of God. And it's not that God doesn't want you to know what He wants you to do with your life. It's just He couldn't write a book, or He could have, I guess. But He didn't write a book for every individual on the face of the earth and say, this is exactly what I want you to do. Because if He did that, there's a chance then that we would value that book more than we valued God. And God's supposed to be first in our life. So there's this process we go through of figuring out what is God's will, what does He want us to do day in, day out. When we get to decisions like careers or, or marriage and we're trying to figure those out, sometimes it's a little bit difficult for us to grab those things. But searching for God's will can seem elusive. But it's not that God doesn't want us to know it. Many times we might make discovering His will more complicated than what it really is. Why would we think, though, that God would not want us to follow His will? 
we got to believe that God wants us to know what it is. Why would He want us to go against that? And so if He wants us to know what it is, that has to mean that He left a pathway for us to figure that out. If you will, stand with me as we read from verse 12. And I want you to think about this concept as we read this text. Because the apostles had to make a decision, and they lean upon both things. They lean upon His revealed will and His concealed will. Verse 12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and His brothers. A couple of interesting things we need to know there as we think about His revealed will and concealed will. One is, they are at the place that He told them to be. He told them to wait on me in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit will come to you. So they're where they're supposed to be. They're obedient at this moment in time. Also, we find that they are together in prayer, which means they're reaching out to God in this moment in time. Look then at verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Notice another thing here. We find Peter saying, referencing Old Testament scripture, which means that he knew the text and he valued the text, and there was something for him to learn from the text that applied to what they were going through that day. Look at verse 18. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his boughs gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that the field was called in their own language, Akadelma, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until today, until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to the resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. Interesting thought here. They identify the qualifications from what they know of what Christ told them. Again, His revealed will. They looked at what He had said. There needs to be twelve. And now they say, all right, here's what needs to happen. He needs to both be an eyewitness of everything. And then they come back together and they pray. And notice the humility in their prayer. God, we do not know. But who does? You know. And so they're, they're bowing before Him saying, you know, we just need you to let us know. Verse 28, to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Bow with me in a word of prayer, if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time You've given us. Lord, we thank You for Your Word that You have preserved for us, that we might look to and reference and understand what Your will for our life would be. We're also thankful that today we have the Holy Spirit that You've provided among each believer so that we might be able to hear from You and be guided and directed throughout life. So, Lord, we pray that we would be more in tune with that Spirit today and this day forward than we have been in the past. And Lord, let us be obedient to it in all ways. And we pray these things in Your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, you may be seated. Going along with what Donnie said, though, if you would like to stand throughout the whole sermon, you're welcome to do that if you would like. Never had anyone do that. But. As we look at the text, realize here that this is a critical point in this time of the early development of the church. 
They were faced with a situation where a decision needed to be made. They didn't know what to lean upon except what they had. And that was the Scripture that God had provided for them in Old Testament. And it was the words that Christ had spoke to them, that, which hadn't been written yet because none of the New Testament was written at this point. And so they're trying to make this decision. When we look at what they did, we find in it a helpful model for us as we go through life today. They were searching for God's will while also seeking to advance the kingdom. Now I want you to keep that statement in mind, advancing the kingdom. When we think about our life here on earth as a believer, everything that we do after accepting Christ should be about advancing the kingdom in some way. Whether it be us sharing the gospel with an individual, whether it be us promoting ministry work in some way, whether it be us going and doing ministry work, in some way we should be about advancing the kingdom. As they're making a decision here, notice their heart was on advancing the kingdom. And so they realize a pivotal key point here, this twelfth person needs to be an eyewitness of all that Christ said and done. He needed to be with us from the beginning until the end, because He's going to be leaned upon to share testimony of what happened. And an eyewitness would be much more valuable in that situation. So they were leaning upon that understanding. Now, when we think of advancing the kingdom, realize that God's will for us will never go against the advancement of His kingdom. We may not understand how it happens in that moment in time, but it will never go against His kingdom advancing. So if we're thinking that we need to do something and it looks as though it's going to cause problems or create problems within the kingdom of God, it's probably not God's will. So we have to look at it from that stand. I want us to first notice the apostles along with Jesus' mother, his half-brothers, in verses 12 through 14, they were all being obedient to Jesus' instruction. We mentioned this a moment ago. These were individuals whose lives had changed because they had met Christ, and especially after the resurrection their life had changed. They were now committed to following Him and His mission. We find his half-brothers didn't believe in him before, and now they're on board, and they're following what he has left for them to do at this moment. One of the important things that we see is that they came together to pray. And when a group decision needs to be made, then the group should be praying about it together. As a church, when we think about a decision that a church needs to make, the church needs to be praying about that together. Now, individually, we do need to pray about it, but as a church, we also need to ask for God, God, God's guidance. Husbands and wives, as you think about raising your children, and even after your children are grown, there are decisions that need to be made. A husband and wife should be praying together about those decisions. After all, we say in the marriage ceremony that it's no longer two, but one. And that one should be praying together. So we find that there is a example we see here in the text of this group that is now about to make this decision praying together. Peter quotes from Psalm 69 and Psalm chapter 109 and then defines the qualifications for the replacement of the apostle. This individual had to be this eyewitness we talked about and they put forward two men which were identified as possible candidates. <clears throat> The apostles and disciples turned to the Lord then in prayer to seek His will for this decision. Prayer was an important part and should be an important part of our decision making with God. Now, secondly, each decision we make should be thought of in how it will impact the advancement of the gospel. The apostles' roles were to be eyewitnesses to people around them and all they had heard and seen Jesus do. And by filling Judas' spot, the early church was acknowledging the value and the need for this eyewitness testimony of the gospel. These eyewitnesses would be needed in order to share the gospel around the world. <coughs> and we should approach every decision by weighing how each choice will either enhance or hinder the gospel advancement around the world. How often do we think about that in our life? When we have a decision to make, whether it be buying a house, whether it be taking a job, not taking a job, 
whether it be going to school, not going to school, how often do we think about how will this impact the kingdom of God? Retirement. Sometimes we get self-focused about retirement. <clears throat> I look forward to those years, whenever they may be, who knows when they'll be. But we start thinking about retirement, and we start thinking about it from our own desire, and what I'm going to do in retirement. <clears throat> And yet maybe it should be, what does God want me to do in retirement? We should approach every decision by weighing how that choice will enhance or hinder the kingdom. To have a twelfth man in their situation would definitely help advance the kingdom by word of eyewitness testimony. Part of God's will is written in black and white. So when we think about His revealed will and His concealed will, <clears throat> we have to approach His Word to figure out what His concealed, or I'm sorry, His revealed will would be. It's written in black and white for us, but we have to open it to see it. Peter knew part of, of God's will here in this situation because he knew the Scriptures. For us today, this means we do not have to worry about whether we should be making disciples. Christ told us we need to go and make disciples. That's not a question in our life. We don't have to worry about whether we should be praying or not. God instructed us, Christ instructed us how we should pray and who we should pray to. So there shouldn't be a question about whether we should have a prayer life with God. Living a holy life, obeying His instructions. That's what He desires us to do. It's spelled out in His text. Loving people who aren't lovable, bearing fruit, being faithful in marriage, caring for orphans, caring for widows, all of those things are defined in text. And we know that they are things that we should be doing. They are part of God's revealed will for us. When we pursue these things, then we are pursuing the right course of action. <clears throat> Now, while the apostles knew they were supposed to fill Judas' spot, they did not know who it should be. God was not hiding it from them. They were just having to work through the process of seeking His will to find out who it would be. Today, we know in our life and in our world that marriage is still sanctioned by God to reflect the message of the gospel through marriage through husband and wife, Christ in the church. It's a reflection of that. But we have to discern who it is, who that specific person is that we should marry. It's an area where we have to work through sound choices based upon His will revealed in the Bible and His will that is revealed to us through prayer and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> If you're here today and you're single and you've been thinking about marriage, one of the things I want to encourage you and tell you is that God gives some very definite instructions on marriage in the Bible. There's a statement in there that says not to be unequally yoked. That's been misinterpreted in a lot of ways in our past, but what it actually is talking about is that we should be with a like-minded believer. So if you're dating someone who is not a believer, I want to encourage you to back up and seek God's will again. I'm not saying that you need to end it. I'm just saying that they need to be a believer. It may mean that God sent you into their life to, to bring you, or uh, to share the gospel with them so that they will become a believer. And after that you become married. There's a great story, Jennifer's grandparents, her grandfather started wanting to date her grand, what is, came to be her grandmother, but she wasn't a believer. And so he first led her to the Lord and then he started dating her. What a wonderful story. But once she was a believer, then they were both on the same page of who they were to be following. And if not, then you go in two separate directions. <clears throat> If you're dating and you're thinking about dating, one of the most important questions that you can ask the other individual is, are you a believer in Christ? Because if not, you're going to head in two separate directions, and it will create problems somewhere down the road. When making decisions that are not revealed in the Bible, 
we should always start with what God has revealed. So our first thoughts about figuring out His will should be, what does the Bible say about this situation? <clears throat> it would seem that if we follow the instructions He's already given us through His Word, it would be much easier to figure out what He has not already given us when we're actively making disciples and trying to live the lives that are in line with what Jesus told us to do here on earth. So let's consider these thoughts. First off, we should trust the Bible as our authority. Look at what Peter does in Acts chapter 1, verse 16. <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 16, Peter says, Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand. Peter is talking here about the importance of looking at Scripture to figure out what God wanted them to do going forward. He understood that Scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it was spoken through David. And so he understood that he should trust the Scripture for direction in their life also. Now he first had to know it in order to be able to, to make that relationship with, between what they were going through and what had actually happened in the past, been spoken in the past. Secondly, we should let the Bible interpret our life. Peter used this Psalm 69 and also 109 to help them make sense of something that had to have them scratching their heads at some point, trying to understand. They couldn't imagine that Judas was going to turn his back. They couldn't imagine Judas was going to hang himself. But once they started looking back at Old Testament, Peter found these two Psalms that speak very plainly about what had occurred. And so Peter connects those two. So we should let the Bible interpret our life when we can. Sometimes we scratch our heads at what goes on though. We ponder why the rich get richer and the suffering continues even for the righteous. We wrestle with the setbacks of life and with affirming the sovereignty of God, especially when nothing makes sense. But just as Peter did, we should always look to Scripture to make sense of our world and our lives. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. We can be guaranteed that in somewhere in Scripture we're going to find something that applies to our life in the situation we're going through in that moment. We should also do what the Bible says. <clears throat> Jesus had appointed 12 apostles and it made clear that there were to be 12, so the apostles make choices and took action with that directive in mind. In the Bible we do find instructions that we are to live holy lives, to participate and contribute to the life of the church, to love and serve our spouses and our families as well as Him, um, and serve Him above all others, not just as well as Him, but serve Him above all others. Now these are clear instructions and they should be followed in life. Those are things that God has written down for us, and we would do well to make sure that we're following those as we're trying to discern the rest of His will for our life. Once we look through the will or through the lens of God's revealed will in the Bible, though, we then have to look for His concealed or His unrevealed will. When we think of God's Word, it should shape our decisions regarding our churches we choose to join. His Word should shape the homes that we choose to purchase, the individual we choose to marry, and the job we choose to pursue. <coughs> to do this, we must gather all the information we can find from a scriptural standpoint. Peter, if you look in verse 21, he says, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all this time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, he goes on, Peter supplies them with all the information and the qualifications from God's Word for the replacement apostle. Peter lays it out and says, here's what we know from Scripture. This is what we know we need to do. The eleven then put forward two candidates based upon those qualifications. We can sometimes, or all the time, can use God's specifics to narrow down our options. But then we have to seek God in prayer. We should pray for wisdom after we've done our homework so that the right decision will be made. <clears throat> the Lord does not see things the way we do. 
So because people judge by outward appearance, we need to be reminded that the Lord looks at the heart. So we should seek His guidance through prayer. And after seeking God in prayer and trusting His sovereignty, we must make a decision and then go with it. Sometimes that's the hard part. We make a decision, but then we're not really willing to follow through with it. We make a decision to be a follower, a believer in Jesus Christ, and we understand that means that we are to share the gospel. But then somewhere along the way we say, well, you know, I'm not really equipped to do that. I don't know how to share the gospel with someone. And so we agree that we should go do it, but then we don't go do it. But after seeking God's will, after seeking Him in prayer, after trusting His sovereignty, knowing that He'll provide what we need in the time we need it, <clears throat> we have to make the decision and we have to go forward with it. After the apostles had determined qualifications that they had spent time in prayer, they cast lots. Now this is the last time in the New Testament that we find a reference to casting lots because after this, shortly after this, they receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in them. The gift that we have, that we enjoy to be able to hear from God on a personal level of what He would want us to do. Today this Holy Spirit is our counselor that helps us make decisions. We don't have to cast lots as they did then. And as we consider making decisions, it should, be fir it should first be in light of the advancement of the kingdom of God as we seek souls to be saved. Secondly, it should be after we've studied from God's Word for what He has already said concerning the issue. Thirdly, we should gather the necessary information in order to narrow the option down. Fourth, we have to cover all these processes in prayer. And then we make a decision and go with it until we feel the Holy Spirit say, you're going the wrong way. And when we he feel that or understand that, then we have to back up and we have to humbly say, Lord, get me on the right path because I've messed up. You see, we can go at it with the exact heart that we need to go. We can have the humble heart that says, I want to do exactly what you want me to do, Lord, but then we can still get it wrong. And at some point we have to humbly say, I got it wrong. And we have to ask for Him to get us on the right path. The wonderful thing about the Father is that He knows if we are truly trying to please Him. He knows our hearts. So when we get to that point and we get it wrong, He knows that we were trying to do it right. Some of you, those of you that have had children, some of you may have a child that is kind of that pleaser child, the person that wants to do everything to please you. Sometimes it's the first child. Not always, but sometimes. Sometimes you're blessed to have a child that's a pleaser, and then you're blessed to have the child that is quite the opposite of that. We were blessed with both. Probably wouldn't have had two if we had the first one first, I would imagine. But that child that's the pleaser, when they come to you, and they want to please you, and they get it wrong, do you quit loving them when they get it wrong? You say, look, I, I know your heart, I know you was trying to do right. Isn't that the same thing that the Heavenly Father does with us? When our heart's in the right place and we want to please Him, do we really think that the Father's going to scold us and say, you done terrible, why did you even think that? Now if our heart's in the opposite place, that's a different matter. But if our heart's in the place where we want to please Him, doesn't He look on us with grace and say, let me get you on the right path. I'm glad you come back to me. If you're a perfectionist or an individual that's afraid to make the wrong choice, then if you're not cautious, you'll let anxiety rule you. You must learn to trust the Father and, and His love for us. And we must act always by the guidance of the Holy Spirit in light of seeing the kingdom grow and advance. <clears throat> but sometimes we let that anxiety prevent us from making the decision we should. 
We become so concerned about whether it's going to be right or wrong that we just don't do anything, such as witnessing to someone about Christ. And we're so afraid that we'll get the, the message wrong that we just don't do anything. I don't know where your heart is today. I don't know what you're facing in life. But I know that there are times in life when we have to deal with some difficult decisions and we have those that we have to make and sometimes we struggle with those. I think we see a plan from here in the last chapter or last part of chapter 1. We see a plan where these individuals were struggling with a decision. They knew they needed to make it. And they go through a process of this. It's covered in prayer, but it also uses what they have. The will of God through what He's revealed through His written Word. And then they lean upon the Lord to help them make that decision. We have the Holy Spirit to help us do that today. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're struggling with a decision this morning. Maybe you need God to help you make that decision in some way. Maybe it's a decision today about making Jesus your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never reached out to Him. Maybe you've never humbled yourself and said, Lord, I, I need You as my Savior. I can tell you that it is the Lord's will for all to be saved. It's just a matter of whether we'll accept that or not. He desires it. That's why He came to this earth, was to seek and save those who were lost. And that included all of us at one point in time. So if you're trying to decide if God wants you to be saved or not, I can promise you He does. It's in His Word. And if you'll open your heart, He'll reach out to you. And He'll desire to be a part of life with you. He wants to be your Savior. Maybe you're in need of just drawing closer to Him because you've drifted away. Sometimes we learn about God's Word, we study it, and we know what it says, but we forget that we're supposed to be obedient to it. And there's things in His Word that we know, and yet in life we just don't do them. Sometimes it's because we've drifted away from Him. Sometimes it's because life has kind of got us going in a different direction. I don't know where you're at today in your walk with Christ. But I know that if you've drifted off the path, I know that He desires for you to come back. If you've got things going on in your life that goes against what His written will is contained here in the Bible, I know He desires you to turn away from those just the same as He does me. So today you may say, well, you know, how does this apply to me? I don't know if you're facing a decision in life. Those of you that may be seniors in high school, you've got some decisions coming up. If you're approaching the end of college, you have decisions to make. If you're approaching the end of your working career and you're facing retirement, you have decisions to make. We always have decisions. The question is, do we confront or do we approach God about those? Because they always need to be made with the kingdom in mind. How does it advance the kingdom? I can tell you that if you're not saved today, if you'll humble yourself and say that you need the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, it will advance the kingdom. If you've drifted off path, you're not doing what the Lord wants you to do, and you know it because you've read, I can promise you if you get that right with the Lord today, it'll advance the kingdom. And if you're just struggling with a decision, and you need to just reach out to the Lord and say, I need your help. I've tried to look through your word to see what I need to do. I just need your help at this point. That will advance the kingdom because you're showing a dependence upon God. That same dependence that each one of us needs to have. So today as we stand together and we make ready for invitation, if you're in a place where you need to, to approach God about some decisions in your life, Maybe you're at a place where you know you need to be saved and you just hadn't submitted to that. Maybe you need to draw closer to Him because you've drifted away. Whatever your place may be in life today, as we pray, would you be obedient to what the Spirit is leading you to do? As we pray at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to You.
Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, your grace that you extend to us in times when we don't deserve it. But Lord, you've promised to be faithful to show it to us. Lord, I pray today as we stand here allowing you, allowing your word and allowing your spirit to work within our heart. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that we be obedient to what you would want us to do. If you've opened our eyes to things that are going on in our life that don't need to be there, Lord, I pray that we would be willing to be obedient to you, to turn from them, to ask for your forgiveness in those. Or maybe they're at a point where we're facing some terrible decisions we've got to make, difficult decisions. We just need your peace about them. Lord, I pray today that we would reach out to you for that. We thank you that you're an approachable God and that even today we can come to you. So guide us in these next few moments and let our hearts be open to your will. And we pray it in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As they sing a verse of invitation, if you would like to come and pray, or I know sometimes decisions are made exactly where you're standing. I would just encourage you today, don't walk away from what God may be placing upon your mind today concerning His will for your life. As they sing. Sing your 
reminded um, that sometimes it's not the decisions that we have to make. Sometimes it's people need us to help as they make decisions. And we need to lean upon God to help us give good guidance as well. God places Christian friends, Christian people in our life. And sometimes we need to make sure that we're reaching out for the right answers. Especially when we're talking about dealing with younger folk, kids that are in school, Facing situations that maybe we didn't face and maybe we don't have the answers, but we need to help them through it somehow. Because if we don't, I can promise you the enemy will. So as we, as we sing just another course, if we could, Brother Donnie, here in just a moment. Maybe you're in a place where you, you got people looking to you. And you just need to take a moment and, and ask God to help you give the right guidance to those who are looking up to you at this time. As we sing, would you well upon Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship Lord, we pray that as we've been in service this morning, and or maybe you've worked within the hearts of some, and Lord, maybe we've had things happen previously in this week where it just makes us realize that we need you more than maybe what we ever knew before. Lord, as we think about the younger generations that come along, kids are in schools now. But we know that the enemy is trying to use the world and to just pull them away. Lord, let us be faithful to pray for them. Let us be faithful to invest in them so that they might know you and they might know that there are people around them that love them and care for them. as we guide them.
So um, let's be in prayer for each other. Let's be in prayer for our young people in the church. And come back tonight. We encourage you to do that. Come back this evening. Support them as they present their uh, CTS uh, entries. And uh, they'll be using their talents to glorify God in the best way they can. We encourage you to come back for that. We're going to dismiss with a song. Um, also remember the choir at 5 o'clock today. Uh, practice, you just show up at 5 and you'll be a part of that. And a couple of songs that will be learned between now and Easter. And uh, let's be in prayer for each other as we go throughout life. Good to have you all today. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. And uh, we hope that you'll come back again and visit with us again. This time, uh, Brother Donnie, if you would, dismiss us with song. All right, let's sing a verse and chorus of A New Name and Glory. Two, three, with blessing.